I think we shall um, make a start now. Carbu is delighted to welcome you all today to this very timely briefing on Libya. Timely because it's a year since uh, last October's ceasefire. And of course, we are meant to be having at least presidential and parliamentary ele elections in just over two months on the 24th of December, though uh, some serious doubts about that. And of course, we want to see progress on the US UN peace plan, the Berlin process, uh, hopefully on a road to a somewhat brighter future for Libya, some 10 years after uh, the protests and the fall of uh, Gaddafi. So we really have a star-studded expert panel for you today with Kabu and who can review the progress and get us up to speed. What are the prospects of elections and uh, the future for Libya? Uh, can uh, all of this heal what has been a divided country for you know, such a long time? Um, we have Asma Khalifa, she's a Libyan activist and researcher, worked on human rights, women's rights and youth empowerment. Uh, she uh, grew up as a non-Arab, an Amazigh, and hopefully we'll hear a, a bit about uh, the challenges facing then. And you've seen her bio, but it's very impressive. In 2017, she was named one of the 100 most influential young Africans uh, in the Africa Youth Awards. And she's the co-founder of the Tamazigh Women's Movement. Uh, we also have Tim Eaton. He's a senior research fellow at Chatham House in their Middle East and North Africa program, specializing in Libya. He's widely written on that. And Tarek Magassi comes and speaks to us again. And he's a policy fellow with the North Africa and Middle East program at the European Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, welcome, all of you. Uh, we are going to start with Tim. Uh, Tim is going to take us through, uh, you know, the process and uh, uh, the pros and cons and, and why there are issues with it. Uh, Tim, a very, very warm welcome to you. Um, and if I just to, before you start, if I could remind everyone just to please keep um, themselves on mute so we can have a really good sound quality. Uh, and of course, we'll have Q&A when we've heard from all three speakers. Thank you very much. Tim, over to you. Thanks very much, Chris, and uh, thank you to Kabu for inviting me on today. What certainly is a, a timely moment to discuss developments in Libya some 70 days out from proposed elections. And so in my short time, I thought I'd just start off by making three main points. Um, the first, just winding back a bit and looking at the development of the political process as we see before us and looking at um, grading that a little bit in terms of the trade-offs that we now face, Libyans and the international community now faces ahead of proposed elections. Before looking at the nature of that process itself, um, I'll, I'll kind of make a slight argument that that's perhaps part of the problem and why we are where we are. Before then briefly circling to some of the prospects, uh, which are a bit dizzying to work out what might happen, how certain actors may react, but I'd like to, to, to just make a couple of basic points on that front. So rewinding then to look at the development of this phase of the political process in Libya, obviously it emanates from uh, the ceasefire agreement late last year, the emergence of the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum. But the thinking really behind this LPDF roadmap and the international approach has been that to fix most of the problems that we see before us in Libya, a unity government is required, whether that's to reunify the central bank, to reform um, institutions that need, urgently need reforming, to agree um, checks and balances in processes like budgets, um, or to cohere the security sector. How could you do that without uh, a unified government? And so the process has been geared towards that goal. Of course, one of the things in, in looking at that process, and it's really worthy of note because it's such a limiting factor, is that effectively the international community is trying to manufacture a foundational moment for a new um, phase of Libyan governance, sustainable and um, consensus based. But that's really hard to do when all of the actors involved have remained pretty self-interested. They have contested legal bases themselves 
And also when it's decided that a new position, in this case, the president is going to be created and there is no uh, agreed constitutional basis. So a lot of the discussions therefore have been about getting to that basis. And really what we've had is procedure for procedure's sake in, in many sense, and the institutions themselves haven't been willing to engage. And perhaps that was entirely um, predictable, but one of the things which is severely limited and undermined this process is that the rules of the game as laid out by the LPDF and enshrined by the UN haven't seemingly been followed by the UN itself. The internationals haven't come to bat for the decisions that have been made. And that has allowed um, the uh, Libyan actors who are seeking to secure their own futures to bend the rules where possible, to disregard elements of the roadmap. And I think frankly, if only some of the roadmap counts, then the lesson for many on the ground is that none of it really counts and why should we follow it anyway? So I think that's a point um, for discussion. And it brings round the question of what we see as an acceptable compromise to kind of get over the line at any proposed elections. And you know, I think a degree of pragmatism is required on this front. It's gonna be very difficult to envisage a perfect process. But really, when we're discussing uh, a presidential uh, elections law, which is not even passed by the House of Representatives itself by a vote, it's unilaterally passed by um, the speaker, then how can we consider that to be uh, the basis, a largely a constitutional basis for the foundation of the new republic, let alone before we bring in um, elements of the degree of necessary consultation with the high state council. So I would argue at the first point that even at the very mo basic most threshold, none of the moves at the moment pass, uh, uh, take the mustard really, they're not, they're not strong enough, they're not coherent enough, and I think they create much more dangers for further uh, disputes and further fragmentation in government rather than a means of bringing it back together. Uh, the second point uh, then brings me to why that may be, why we might be seeing some of these dynamics. And I think that um, is in large part due to the nature of the process. And in some senses, it's process for process sake, meetings to, discuss, to decide when things will happen, who will be appointed, and it really places all of the cards in whoever prevails at the elections. And in that sense, I think it's created somewhat of a zero sum game. So each of the contestants for power have been seeking to rig that process to best protect their own interests and everything has become connected. So we've got to a point where almost nothing can be decided until everything's decided. So there's no budget because it's a dispute over spending of the government and the parliament doesn't want to let the government be, to run away with it, the money. And at the same time, they'll also leverage discussions over new, the appointment of, to new sovereign positions. And at the same time, they'll also leverage those discussions over elements around the elections. So we see everybody keep shifting. And even as the, the timeline is more than imperiled and unsustainable, those actors have stuck um, to those approaches. And I think, that reflects the fact that some of the key issues, the drivers of the conflict that we see in Libya just aren't addressed through this process. It's kind of anticipated that the new government addresses them once it comes in. But I would argue that a more meaningful process needs to actually have some foresight and start to address some of these elements as part of the process. For example, we saw at the weekend yet another reference from Eastern um, politicians about the distribution of resources. And there is no um, consensus over these elements or it's not part of the political process. The necessary reforms to the state for it to work in a different, more consensus-based fashion aren't really part of the discussions. And I think that's a problem. Uh, so, conscious of time, because I want to make sure we have plenty of time for the discussion. I think that um, this is an area which has to be addressed to stop those uh, parties from simply looking at the election as uh, a full stop. It needs to be a more sustainable process. They need to be find ways to buy people in. And whether that's getting uh, potential candidates to agree to parameters of what they might do in power, whether it's having a more robust economic track, which actually meaningfully feeds into the process, 
I think those things have to happen in order to place um, less imperative on just the person or people who prevail. And finally, I think just in terms of the prospects, there seems to be quite a, a array of potential outcomes here with the elections happening and being contested, not happening at all, happening after significant delays. And there have been indications that there might be a new even Eastern-based government that might emerge. Equally, there have been um, statements that we might see a return to conflict. Just one main point to note here that I think actually it's much more difficult for the East to do that in the way that it did before because it's broke. It built an economic system founded on debt uh, previously in order to run some of its own um, operations and it did so pretty uh, with great difficulty. It doesn't have that luxury now. Similarly, if there is to be a potential return to conflict, it's difficult to see Hafta in his weakened state being able to uh, spearhead that in the way that he had before, principally in 2019. So that seems to me to leave quite a mixed picture where it's not clear really what happens or what fundamentally changes after the 24th of uh, December if political promises aren't kept. I'll, I'll stop there, Chris. Thank you very much, Tim. And <clears throat> I think you've raised a lot of point, points there that uh, hopefully will come up uh, in the Q&A, just to remind you, if you wish to ask uh, a, a question of our panelists, uh, um, if you could put them in the chat. Uh, questions only, please. Uh, I'll be very grateful for that. Now we're gonna turn to Asma. Asma, are you with us? Yes. Yeah, hi. hi. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Uh, well, I would like I would start with um, giving a, a brief overview about the, the political legal infrastructure for the elect for the elections and why we have some extremely problematic laws or insufficient laws um, that that will be easily contested should the results um, be in favorable for some of the actors that, or, or I, sh I should stop calling them actors <laughs> I should just use spoilers uh, instead. So we have the, the biggest problem uh, is the political isolation law, which has been cancelled by the government 2015 and then cancelled by the House of Representatives in the same year. But it was after uh, when the high court uh, have also ruled that the House of Representatives um, is, is, is no longer valid. So it's not clear really what happens to this law. Um, no one mentions it now anymore. Uh, especially with with court cases uh, of head Gaddafi figures being, you know, dismissed or or release of prisoners as part of reconciliation efforts from the government. So and um, and this this unclarity, I would say, which exists in all legal texts since 2012, is is the biggest problem. So we have we have the political parties law that was, was existed since 2012 and. Um, this year, this, there's been a surge of political parties uh, forming up for, to run for elections. Um, it has contradictory clauses when it comes to funding and whether the government is funding um, some of, or all of the activities. Um, it, it says that it's, it, it will specify things, but it never references um, uh, anything. And, and this leaves to... Um, um, also, um, a, a new development, which the Muslim Brotherhood Party dissolved itself and called itself, I think, is it uh, a recovery and resurrection or something as an NGO and not a political party. And then the members, I think, have formed their own parties, as, uh, a few of them. So uh, it's it's and this law has been critiqued uh, extensively over the year. But of course, because of the civil war and the conflict. There has and the lack of a constitutional uh, body that is viable for the for, for the whole country it's not been um, fixed and then you have of course the impressive Aguila Saleh presidential and parliamentary laws um, that that he has released in in track record without voting the presidential law that has um, exactly no provisions on what the president should be like and his relationship to the parliament, except for when um, uh, submitting, I think it was budgets um, in, in the article. 
um, the uh, High Commission for Elections have asked for this amendment and the House of Representatives reviews. So it's still not been voted on. The law um, also upholds the law parliamentary number, uh, upholds uh, law number 24 of nationalization and citizenship in Libya. And that moves me then to this next, to the next uh, uh, element of my of, of overview. And that is then what, what happens to um, members of the Tebo and the Tebo Tuareg community in the south of Libya who are stateless and do not have a national number. Also, uh, children of Libyan women married to foreigners and certain even Libyan women married to foreigners uh, who do not have a national number. So we have um, a, a big problem uh, in terms of representation of not only who's allowed to elect themselves, but also actually voting for elections. Those who do not have a national number um, are basically treated as complete foreigners and they're not allowed um, allowed to participate in political life and, and electoral law. The um, both laws reference the House, the High Commission for Election for for running the election and the distribution of of the electoral um, ballots. That um, that also have the distribution also marginalizes, especially in the south, uh, the Tebu community. I've been looking at the list uh, that's that belongs to the parliamentarian um, uh, law where uh, Benghazi has 16 seats uh, on its own. And then for some reason, they divided Tripoli into six uh, localities um, and each will have its seat that comes up to uh, 21. I don't know what, what was the purpose of doing that instead of saying, say Tripoli, but dividing it in different, I don't know if it is to look that it doesn't have as more seats than Benghazi. <laughs> I would guess something to that effect. Uh, but still, the distribution of seats is a problem because um, seat towns like Zuwara, which is predominantly Amazi, will complete, compete over a seat with three, four other villages, predominantly Arab and, and so on. So this, this issue of, uh, of representation uh, um, is, is extremely problematic, um, not to mention that already there's nobody, no, nobody has stepped down except maybe Aguila said he suspended his membership, but then he continued to work. Um, that's so that's already a lot of people violating that condition in the presidential law, um, and and that can also be um, yeah can be a problem uh, after the election if someone was not happy with the results. So it, in overall, it's. Um, it's unclear. It's it's text that does not um, treat the conflict as it's it's still like it's 2012, <laughs> and we haven't been in a in a civil war for nine years. So it's it's yeah extremely problematic. I'll give um, I'll give more to Tarek now. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Asma. And that last comment was particularly you know depressing. You know um, that we haven't really progress since 2012 uh, after all that's happened. So we're going to turn now to Tarek and Tarek is going to, I think, uh, have a look at uh, the international actors for us, um, a fascinating subject and obviously one that'll be of interest to, to, to Brits on the, on the call. Tarek, uh, what's the international community been up to or not up to? Thank you very much, Chris, and, and thanks for for inviting me to, to speak and and yeah I suppose a lot of what I say will focus on the on the international actors or, or largely the kind of European Western UN actors involved because you know when you set this kind of framing of, of what's the future for for the Libyan political roadmap the more I thought about it the more it just seemed that you know the immediate future or the outcome of this roadmap it's perhaps almost entirely dependent now on, on what the UN and what various Western actors choose to do and, and how to, to, to treat it. Um, and yeah, I, I hope the, the reasons for that become clear as I, as I go on. But, you know, in trying to, to frame this, um, this question of, of what's the future of the political roadmap, I, I think it just entirely depends on, on who you ask, right? Um, so if you go to, to some of these key officials like the, the UN Special Envoy Jan Kulbish or to some key capitals like Washington DC or Paris, then you, know, you might think that the future is actually quite bright. 
um, because they are all adamant that, that come what may, elections will be held on December 24th. Um, and log logistically speaking, that is indeed um, ten tentatively possible. Um, and meanwhile, you know, the political or the substantive problems in play are kind of nonchalantly dismissed by a, a simplistic and a, a kind of dubious legal process. Um, whereby they say that the risk of, of having elections is seen as less than the risk of not having them on, on that specific date. Um, and because the roadmap ends on, on the elections of that date, there isn't much thinking that that's being given to the day after the vote. Um, so, you know, whilst the, the international community, and, and by that, I mean, the, the Western world is, is certain that elections must be held on that particular date, you know, as Tim and Asma and others have, have pointed out, um, nobody ever really agreed on any law to, to govern these elections. And it remains a, a point of considerable confusion um, as to what exactly Libyans will be voting on come December 24th, which is, is kind of an important point when it comes to elections. It is the, the product of there being no clear constitutional basis. Um, see, the, the, initially the, the UN roadmap, which was cast last December, was, was, was very rich in hopefulness, yet rather poor on details. But it did have one specific detail as the end point, which was that elections to, to completely renew Libya's political system would be held on December 24th, 2021. Um, however, you know, after stalling the, the entire electoral process until a few weeks ago, the, the Speaker of Libya's parliament, uh, as Tim laid out, he, he, he passed an electoral law without consulting his parliament. And this remade Libya's transitional system from a parliamentary one to a presidential one. It, it removed the main mandate, which has been kind of the raison d'etre of Libyan politics since 2011, which is to finish the transitional period that was triggered by, by the Arab Spring Rev Revolution against Gaddafi, and to create a kind of formal permanent constitution and permanent political system in its place. And this, this electoral law had even failed to, to kind of place itself as a subsequent part of all of the diplomatic work and agreements since 2011, such as the, the Berlin Conference or the Libyan Political Agreement, which ironically enough, le legitimized all of these actors or, or spoilers in the first place and is enabling these elections to take place. And, and just to, to kind of top the whole thing off, the law then opened the field of play so that you know, all of Libya's own war criminals could, could run for this office of absolute power, of, of no real clear legal mandate or restrictions and which has you know, no wider political or, or governance framing attached onto it, and then, you know, simply be able to return to their barracks should they lose. Uh, and you could argue that that such a play was designed to provoke outrage and designed to provoke opposition and to stop the electoral process rather than to make it happen. Yet, um, you know, our UN Special Envoy in his, in his infinite wisdom, he moved very quickly to, to validate and then to approve this extra legally passed law. And then he moved to, to block the UN's own consensus building system, which was dubbed the, the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum, from being able to meet and discuss and you know, maybe build some kind of consensus through changes to the law. And this created a very dangerous precedent whereby the Speaker of the House can, can just unilaterally pass laws. And this need to hold elections on that specific date created a system of pressure which would you know, push through any law that the Speaker should wish to pass regardless of you know, just how ridiculous those laws were. So of course, the, the Speaker of the Parliament pushed his luck and a few weeks later, he had a, a parliamentary law passed in a similarly dubious process, which pushed parliamentary, par parliamentary elections back to this uh, you know, undisclosed date, which is to be determined at some point from 30 days after the presidential election takes place which is in complete violation of the, the UN roadmap state stated goal for presidential and parliamentary elections together. And so, you know, as you can see, and as Tim laid out, there is ample ground to, to dispute the entire electoral process. And it's something that's not really helped by the, the dire security system in the country, whereby candidates will not be free um, to run in much of the country without fear of kidnap and murder. Uh, and where even, you know, in municipal elections, militias often stuff ballot boxes. Um, so we have a system being constructed whereby Khalifa Haftar, uh, who, those of you who don't know him, the, the military man who has stalled kind of all political progress and, and processes over the last six years through his desire to, to conquer Libya, and who was responsible for, for the deaths of thousands of Libyans and for considerable war crimes, 
he's going to run for president. And, and should he lose, um, he is now able to claim that he and his army do not actually respect the electoral process or the legitimacy of the system. He's already said at a rally um, a few months ago that his army or, or what re remains of it will never be subjugated to civilian control. So it's basically just a, a return to the status quo. And, and similarly, one of the main obstacles to all progress that the Speaker of the Parliament, Aguila Saleh, he will probably run for president. And should he fail, he will return to his parliament, stall the parliamentary elections and repeat this kind of magic trick he does every few years where he blames all of the ills of the country on other politicians and, and sets up a rival government, which allows him to stay in power and kind of build support through patronage networks. Um, so if you go back to this kind of initial premise of, of who do we ask about this roadmap and what it tells us, then, you know, these Libyan politicians, some of whom I've mentioned, others like the, the Prime Minister, the Beba, I'll, I'll kick it on to, are, are also very happy because they've managed to subvert the entire raison d'etre of the roadmap. You know, this roadmap was initially designed to get rid of what the former special representative, Stephanie Williams, accurately dubbed Libya's political dinosaurs. But, but now it's become ironically this vehicle, which will see them continue in power, perhaps indefinitely. Um, you know, it also gives the, the current prime minister, Debeba, a win-win scenario, much like Aguila or Haftar, whereby he is leveraging his current office uh, to play the populist card, to basically just hand out money to citizens uh, under the knowledge that a one man, one vote system in Libya will likely see him elected as Libya's new omnipotent president given Libya's demographics, whereby the population is, is largely in Tripoli. And he also knows that, that the majority of the population in Western Libya will never accept Haftar as president, given you know, he spent the last few years trying to kill them, um, nor really Ag Aguila, who, who cheered Haftar from behind and remains utterly unrepentant about it. Um, so we may not know who will win these elections, but we can comfortably predict how the losers will react. And in each case, it kind of leaves us with a scenario that, that looks very similar to what we have today, whereby Libya's highly corrupt, entirely venal politi political class continue this, this pantomime of an East-West rivalry that just very conveniently allows them to stop any genuine progress and, and to continue looting the country. Um, and I use another former special representative word there, who you know, said on Libyan TV once that the term corrupt was too kind because what is going on is actually the looting of the state. Um, the only real difference will be, you know, in before and after the elections that we have squandered our elections card. We've squandered our opportunity for change. We've squandered the credibility of the UN and the lifespan of a process that is owned, you know, by the UN and driven by, by European and, and US actors. Um, and you know, the last relevant group whose, whose perspective to consider on the future of the roadmap is the, the Libyan people. And you know, I don't have polls or statistics to back up what I'll say. It's only really anecdotal evidence, but the anecdotes I hear are, are never positive. They're, they're very nihilistic. And this is a huge change from 12 months ago, you know, in the aftermath of that horrible war on Tripoli, um, where there was real hope for, for sweeping change. But, but since, you know, the Beba bought his way into office, since these old pantomimes from Aguila and Haftar played out in, in, in the same way with the same impunity, fatalism has just returned. And, you know, I know I'm, I'm kind of pushing the time here, but I just want to make one last point. Because I'm a, I'm a policy guy by trade, I just want to end this by saying that, you know, it doesn't really have to be this way. You know, there, there is a way out from this kind of snookering that, the international community have put themselves under. Um, we do not really need to hang ourselves by an electoral date that was largely selected for, for performative reasons. And so to dishonorably ignore the kind of context of the present moment just to honor a date. Um, you know, we do not have to exist in this kind of manufactured dichotomy whereby elections happen on December 24th or they don't happen at all. Uh, and the key to this is, is to stop ceding control to, to the arsonists to dominate Libyan politics under the guise of having a Libyan-led process. You know, there are a lot of Libyans in the country. Having a Libyan-led process does not mean that we must enable what was a political gambit from Aguila Saleh to then become the electoral and political framework on which the entire transition and political future of Libya will depend upon. And we can also add more stops to this roadmap than just elections on the 24th of December. You know, build some, de some degree of consensus, have a workable constitutional mandate that, that provides some visibility beyond December 24th, and that makes elections part of a broader process towards stability, 
rather than an end in and of themselves. You know, these restrictions that, that the UN and the West are currently operating in are entirely of their own creation, which just makes this even more bizarre. You know, it's a date that they won't budge from. It's a law designed to provoke that they now refuse to allow to be fixed up other than a kind of half-hearted attempt where they politely asked Aguila if he would reconsider. He said no, so they move on. And, you know, all of these things are, are decisions that capitals are making to, to provide expediency, um, sorry, to prize expediency over substance, to prize it over integrity and, and frankly, good sense with it. So, you know, what's the future for the roadmap? If, if the roadmap is all about elections on December 24th, then sure, it's pretty rosy. Um, but for those of us who are invested in Libya on December 25th and afterwards, it's, it's one of increasing despair. Um, so sorry, on that pessimistic note, despite trying to be a policy guy, uh, I'll pass it back to you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tarek. And um, <clears throat> it's, uh, I, I wasn't expecting a, an overwhelmingly optimistic uh, scenario, but uh, are we seeing here then, uh, you know, another example where perhaps in the West and Europe, where we always seem to get overly focused on particular electoral dates, whether it's a constitutional referendum or an election, and somehow there's this obsession with it. We saw this in Iraq, we've seen it in other countries. Um, it, it, it strikes me as, as a little bit of what we've seen here. And I'd also, you know, uh, just throw out there this issue of, you know, uh, mercenaries and armed actors in, in this and the, in, in the role of international actors in, uh, in supposedly they're meant to leave, but What's happening there? Um, was that a direct question? Um, if you could. <laughs> well, with the with the um, foreign mercenaries, I mean, sure, there are you know mercenaries and formal forces from Turkey. There are Russian mercenaries there who are kind of operating completely off their own, guys. You know, uncontrolled by by Haftar, and there is supposed to be a plan to get rid of them, uh, and then even a new more built out plan was agreed um, by Libya's military commission under the guise of the UN just last week. Um, but there doesn't seem to be any, any substantive detail um, in this plan other than kind of politely asking uh, other people to leave the country and just hoping that, that they will listen. And as Tim pointed out in, in what he said, um, this is largely due to the fact that everybody is, is waiting to see what happens with the elections first. And I would wager that both Turkey and Russia are happily sitting back uh, and watching the UN and the West burn their credibility, waiting for chaos to erupt on, on December 25th, um, whereby their currency is, is being people with, uh, with men on the ground and with leverage on the ground will suddenly outweigh this performative act by, by European actors, whereby they say, well, we, we, we must prize a process and, and so on and so forth, which is only gonna to lead to division. So yeah, it's another one of these intractable pro, uh, problems to add to the list. So thanks for adding it, Chris. <laughs> Well, I wish I didn't uh, wish I didn't have to. Okay, well, we got a question from Zaid Belbagi. Zaid, are you there? No, well, he, he's asking, um, uh, perhaps we'll put this to you, Asma, um, about Saif al-Islam and his res resurrection as a, uh, a kinmaker. And I suppose I can broaden it out. I mean, you know, the whole issue of the surviving uh, sons of, of Gaddafi and their role. I mean, do they have any resonance all of this or is this just a sort of external obsession with the Gaddafi name and, uh, and so forth and that they won't really represent you know, not much of a political presence. Um, no, actually, they have a real presence. The green, uh, the green groups. They have media outlets that have been active lately. Uh, they've been running dis disinformation campaigns on social media. There, there has been even polls on social media about who would vote for for safe if he if he runs for elections, and there was a, a big number. Well, on the poll. Uh, of people saying that they would vote for him, but is is I mean it's still not clear really if he's alive and and uh, and and what was going on. And still, there's the issue of of um, yeah, of being on the list of uh, international criminal court, 
which has not been resolved by his lawyers. Uh, so it's, and this article on, uh, on the New York, which I don't know if some of you have read or not, um, that has portrayed him in this like enigmatic, mysterious, I mean, it's a good article, but yeah, still like, we'll it wasn't I really clear. About. He's interested in returning to politics. It's not clear if he's going to run for his elections this year. Um, so, because there's been no appearance of him I, I, don't, I wouldn't be surprised, though, given Libyan politics, that he would come up like two weeks before the elections and say, I'm running for elections. Um, so it's it's really, um, um, it's, it's I mean, it's a problematic and, but understandable stance from, from the Libyans um, that they would want to, to feel nostalgic about Gaddafi's time when they have lived through the horrors of the past 10 years. I can understand that position, but it's incredibly sad. It was a New York Times article, I think it was, wasn't it, um, back in perhaps July. Um, we have a, uh, somebody has written in with a question, Rosa Alvarez, I think is on, on the call. Rosa, what are your questions to the panel? If she's there. Hi, Rosa. Um, well, she, she's asked um, a, a number of questions, really. Um, who are the most serious presidential candidates and which are, the most, which are the most solid political parties with chances to win legislative elections? Um, who'd like to have, answer that one? Oh, I picked Tim, go on. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Um, just before I do answer that, I just wanted to come back to um, think on, on the process and, you know, what could be done. I mentioned that um, in the problem in part was that the internationals, the UN principally, wasn't sticking up for its own rules. So, you know, one thing that really has I've struggled to understand is, despite the flaws in Aguila's proposed presidential law, why wasn't there pressure for an HOR meeting to take place for a full vote? Um, you know, we live in a democratic country here where poor laws are passed, but it is the right of uh, legislatives to try and pass laws, in, albeit with the HOR having some responsibility to consult with the HSC. And we know that they can meet because they did so um, only six or seven months ago to, um, to ratify the formation of the GNU. But we didn't even see that. So um, moving ahead without even the, the players agreeing to respect the result, agreeing on the rules that they're playing by, um, is, I think, um, is highly problematic. And I think that's where if it's not going to be the UN, where is the US on this? This kind of softly, softly, guys, can you just talk? Doesn't seem to be uh, enough for me. And I think that there needs to be uh, more, more pressure then because... We know what happens in the aftermath of contested elections in Libya, and it isn't good. Um, in terms of then the players, well, I think we've seen some uh, gambits and counter gambits. Of course, one of the things that's been happening in the background is that um, the Debeba strategy has been effectively to distribute um, funds, patronage, uh, contracts, be seen to be someone who is able to fix Libya's problem and spread the wealth. Um, whilst the kind of political carnage and theatre continues, and also contributing it to it likely by trying to um, bring people into line with that with that approach and support uh, the main, his maintenance in in position. And of course, there are now indications that he could run if he wished. And so that's also highly problematic. Another element of the LPDF, which is being which would be a, a complete U turn, but. That um, patronage network has actually proven pretty effective um, at distributing funds. The background of the debaters, of course, is in running uh, state development budgets for uh, ODAC, the cannily titled Organization for the Development of Administrative Centers. And billions of dollars of funds used to go through there. And those lines are being reopened. ODAC projects are being restarted. And nobody would argue that Libya doesn't require development spending and for things to be fixed, but it's being done so without a development plan, without oversight of that spending, and that raises flags. 
but also gives the debaters quite a strong platform from which to contend. Of course, we see um, Aguila and, uh, and Hafter kind of doing a bit of a dance um, in the East with one trying to play off against the other. And we've seen particularly that, that play out with the Egyptians in terms of the Egyptians perhaps shifting a little bit away from um, Aguila towards, uh, towards Hafter and then have to kind of coming back almost because of the lack of progress of his um, of his opponents. So, you know, it's very difficult to imagine um, free and fair elections in some of these locations. And and so these players will be very, very prominent in terms of the parties. And you don't really see many with a coherent um, platform. And in fact, one of the notable things about all of these discussions, again, is that it's about process. It's not about policies. And in some ways, Debeba has been quite smart on some of these things. We now see a kind of little battle between the GNU and the HOR over who can give Libyans the most money ahead of elections. Um, Debeba is proposing giving uh, uh, thousands of um, dinars to young people who are about to marry, for example. And then the House of Representatives has come back with its own um, proposal to, to, to dish out funds. So that's kind of um, where we are. But it's very difficult to see any figure being a consensus figure in that. Uh, and it's increasingly um, uh, you know, fragmented. And I think even there where Debeba's GNU was able to buy in a lot of different actors at the beginning um, earlier this year, we also see with the statement of some of the Eastern ministers um, over the weekend that he's losing them too. So this is drifting and there is no stewardship of the process, which is desperately needed. And I think it needs to come from the US if it's not going to come from the UN. Just finally, on the, um, on the Greens point, I think it's often assumed that the Greens are a clear constituency that has a consensus among them over who they'll back. That's not really our experience of it. And of course, actually elements that we would have described as green in the past are actually backing different horses at the moment. And in a sense, Haftar is um, uh, an opponent for Saif al-Islam and, and vice versa. So that also creates all kinds of different problems. And I'll continue to be um, uh, suspicious of someone's chances as long as they can't even operate in the open. So Saif al-Islam gives that um, NYT interview, but actually very few of the words were his own, and he does it from a hiding place. That doesn't sound like a strong platform um, for him to build off of. Thank you, Tim. Um, Alex Werman, uh, you've got a question. Are you with us, Alex? Yes, hi, Chris. Thanks for, uh, thanks for selecting me. Uh, so I did have one question specifically relating to Khalifa Haftar and the prospects for, for security reintegration. Um, I wonder what, what would need to happen to sort of marginalize him, whether that be from international actors or from domestic actors, and what would be needed to, to prompt the sort of reintegration of security forces? And is there anything that could happen with elections that would make that more likely over the coming year or even more than that? Thank you. I think I'm going to pass this over to Tarek, and it's a big issue, of course, you know, the unification of, you know, the military security forces and so forth and how that, you know, could happen. Tarek. Yeah, thank you. And, um, you know, there does just seem to be a rather awkward Haftar shaped obstacle um, in the path of any attempt to do security sector reform in Libya. Uh, you know, in the aftermath of his, his failed attack on Tripoli, there was this commission that was put together. They called it the, the five plus five commission, whereby they take five military officers from Western Libya and, and five from Haftar. And the idea was that they would agree a ceasefire and then they would build towards military unification and, um, and security sector reform. But all plans um, or you know, the work of the five plus five just kind of ended after the ceasefire agreement. Um, and, and since then, there have been other plans that are quietly floated by, by security actors and military actors. But you have this awkward sticking point whereby Haftar is adamant that he will only accept uh, a reform plan whereby he becomes the head of the army. Uh, his army 
essentially defeated and largely scattered. It's a lot smaller than it used to be. Um, he's literally kept alive by, by Russian mercenaries who don't even consult him on what they do anymore. Um, and so it's not a position that anybody else is willing to entertain. Uh, he is blocking other people from his military establishment, such as the chief of staff, um, Naduri, to, to kind of take a more prominent role because he's scared of losing influence. So it's a sticking point whereby you want to try to figure out a way forward, but you need to figure out how to marginalize Hafta. And whilst he has got such concerted support from such key capitals as, as Abu Dhabi, as Paris, as Cairo, um, and even with the United States taking him seriously to a, to a degree, um, he feels emboldened to, to be able to keep being the obstacle that he is, knowing that eventually, you know, luck will turn in his favor as it does, you know, uh, every few years or so. Um, so we, yeah, we continue to de devise plans that won't move forward, but uh, inshallah khair as every uh, speech on Libya seems to end with. <laughs> Indeed. Right, we've got a question from uh, Peter Rundle. Peter. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, I was just looking at the law as uh, promulgated by the Speaker of the House of Representatives, um, which requires as the first condition for the candidacy for the President of the state to be a Libyan Muslim of Libyan Muslim parents. Um, that seems uh, at variance with the constitutional declaration provision that there shall be no discrimination on the grounds of religion, creed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I wasn't clear whether this requirement was one of the ones which uh, HNEC had questioned in the law, and if so, whether it has been dropped from the version of the law that is uh, now supposed to be being approved by the House of Representatives. If not, where does this take us? Thank you. Asma, do you want to have a go at that? Yeah. So, uh, yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's it's not only these some of these conditions that are in contradiction with the constitutional declaration, but also other articles. Um, and the high the high national high um, the commission for elections sorry uh, has has pointed that out but um, but the house of representative well Aguila, <laughs> refused to um, refused to amend so it's still in violation uh, of the declaration and well that leaves us like a lot of other Libyan texts that are very you know faffy and unsubstantial or or sometimes in contradiction um that is anyone who's gonna anyone who would be in power can use them to um to either gain power or discriminate against someone it's yeah it's incredibly problematic thank you very much now we've got a question from robin lamb robin is robin with us Sorry, taking a little time for it to respond to unmute, um, <laughs> but uh, there I am. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> there was a, um, a joint statement the other day by something like 16 uh, so-called political parties. Uh, I, only, I only recognized a couple like uh, Isha Olivia and uh, the National Democratic Alliance. Uh, um, so what I was, my question is, is um, do any of these parties uh, have any real political support or influence? Um, or are they, in fact, perhaps just entities built around a single individual? I mean, Echiar is, um, you know, we are, it's Nahed, um, Aref Ali Nahed, um, you know, behind that. And of course, the National um, Forces Alliance, I think, um, the, its former head is now dead, for example. So do any of them have any real political role in this? Um, or really is uh, the only people who really matter are uh, the prominent players we all know of, uh, like Dubeba, Aguila, Hafta, Bashaka, uh, and maybe one or two others. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Tarek, are you going to have a go at that one? Sure. I'll, I'll try to not be too controversial. But... um. I would largely agree with your with with how you framed it. Um, the political parties are just not very influential. They don't have much of a of, cons of a constituency on the ground in Libya. 
they're either built around personalities, um, and these are personalities that are more prominent on the international scene than they are within the country, um, or like the National Forces Alliance, they have a, a unifying creed, but it's not so much a, a political party as a very loose alliance of convenience amongst um, some quite disparate actors. Um, so yeah, the, the main actors will be as we can see them. And I'm sorry to be a bit too cynical here perhaps, but the elections in Libya will not be like your typical elections whereby you know everybody turns out and votes with their conscience. Um, they will be largely de determined by who can pay the most militias to stuff the most ballot boxes, which is why people like Haftar have an outsized um, um, opportunity to do well. Um, and even why you know somebody like uh, Debeba might do significantly better than his reputation su suggests. So there, there is that aspect of the elections that we have to take into account and why we also might see a, a left-wing candidate or sorry, not left-wing, but somebody to come from an unexpected place and to, um, to actually end up doing quite well because he'll be able to buy support. Um, thanks. Thank you very much, Tarek. Now we've got a, a couple of questions from Michael Cousins. Michael, are you with us? Yes, I am, if you can hear me. Uh, the, the question that I, I the, the, uh, interests me most is this assumption that Dubeba is going to stand. Um, people are, I, uh, close to him have told me that he doesn't want to stand. He wants to remain as prime minister. But what he wants is to have a candidate uh, who, will, um, who will represent him. Sorry, um, uh, that that he will get a candidate who wants to uh, who wants to who, who wants to keep him on. And one of the things that's not been said about the presidential elections is uh, one of the laws is that the president. Uh, one of the rules is that the president will then appoint a prime minister, will then appoint a vice president. And each of these has got to come from one of the other parts of, of the country. And it seems likely to me that you will get the candidates saying, so-and-so is going to be my prime minister, so-and-so is going to be my deputy uh, president, to try and gather support in those areas. So theoretically, we could have uh, uh, Fatih Bashaga, in fact, not being a candidate for for, for president, but being a candidate for prime minister, linked to Aguila Saleh. But I come back to this. Do you think that Dubeba actually wants to stand? Uh, who would like to have a crack at that? Um, I'll, I'll have a go. Um, well, I think it's there's a lot of these parts are moving uh, at the moment, right? And it's not clear exactly how the powers will be delineated. And of course, Aguila's law in that regard is, is consequential. There have also been discussions about lists being put forward and um, as a way of synchronizing the, the poll. And so I think that um, my understanding of these things, a lot of these discussions are, are pretty active. Um, I would operate off of the assumption that um, the, Abdul Hamid al Dubeba will seek to retain an office uh, of, of which he believes will have the most influence. Um, and that may well involve, as you say, um, going into partnership or proclaiming lists. But I think all of those things still are, are yet to play out, at least in my mind. Maybe the other panelists will have a, a stronger sense of it. But um, just on Bashaga, I mean, he was such a strong proponent of a strong presidency. And one of the interesting things, of course, is that after um, Aguila comes out with his uh, proposed presidential law, it's difficult not to call it law, but wasn't anyway, but let's call it law for argument's sake, um, that uh, Fatih Bashaga was one of those to come out uh, in praise because he has said, um, relatively clearly in other fora that he believes that only a strong presidency has the chance of governing the country effectively. So um, we'll see. Obviously, these some of these players have cut deals in the past, but it feels like there's a long way to run before they know what the shape of the deal needs to be because the, the ground is still, is still shifting somewhat. The strange thing, in a way, is that... Um, there aren't a lot of clear indications. I mean, the French came out relatively soon after the 
uh, presidential law and were, were positive, as was UNSMIL, but then you didn't get the same kind of feedback from the parliamentary law. So, you know, it just feels like we're, we're without a shepherd here and that um, there are a lot of assumptions being made and people are recalibrating as we go quite rapidly. Thanks, Tim. I'm going to take the final question from Christine Roundkiar. I'm not sure if I pronounced her name right, but then I will also come back to all three speakers for any final comments, if you wouldn't mind, that'd be great. Christine, are you there? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Great pronunciation. Um, I just wanted to pick up on what Tarek said about Turkey and Russia sort of being on standby, waiting for what's going to happen post 24 uh, December and waiting for the expected chaos that might unfold then. And I'm, I'm a bit interested to understand um, how the speakers think the international dimension of the conflict might evolve in terms of the positions of different countries. So we saw that the international dimension became quite determinative uh, from 2019 and during that offensive and especially the military support and the willingness to, to back the different sides, especially of Russia, UAE and Turkey. Um, so how do you see international uh, actors and, and maybe notably regional actors that have provided military support in the past position themselves in a post elections or no elections uh, period, especially if there were to be a military buildup, maybe not an outright assault? Um, do, you, do you think they'll be willing to increase military support again and fuel the conflict thereby? And um, just finally, what is your take on, on Egypt's sort of appeared change in policy towards Libya? Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and for all the other great questions. So I'm gonna go in the reverse order that we started with, um, ask them to, to, to give a response to uh, Christine's question, but also, as I said, any final comments. So uh, back to you, Tarek. Thanks, Chris. Um, and yeah, thank you a lot for that question, because I've been feeling a bit guilty that I was billed to talk about the international dimension. And I spent more time talking about the internal Libyan process. So I'm going to assuage that guilt by starting my response by talking about the internal Libyan process. Um, the, you know, if we speculate to how things will go after 24th of December, it's going to be a disputed framework, right? Um, so I would guess that, you know, people like Haftar in the East or other candidates or other couplings, as Michelle pointed out, will have you know, enough of the vote to be able to stake a claim and say, well, the rest of it was disputed or, or, or done by militias in Tripoli and so on. And so I think we're going to have a system whereby different countries back their proxy uh, in the dispute resolution or in the kind of political deal-making that's going to happen after the elections. Um, for Egypt, I think they've lost the notion of having one guy that they would like to back more than anybody else. Uh, for them, the most important thing is that they retain this vehicle of the Libyan Arab Armed Forces, Haftar's armed group, uh, and that they try to ensure that any security sector ref reform gets fitted into that. Um, but, you know, beyond that, it will be um, uh, the Emirates and France backing their guy, um, and Turkey trying to back the Beba, I do believe he will run because I think he will, him or his family will look for the office of most power, which is now going to be the presidency. Um, and I think that Turkey will back him for, for continuity's sake and to maintain the very close relationship that they have. The one wild card to this, of course, is the Russians, who I think thrive on chaos. They have a very, they have a relatively low footprint on the ground um, compared to Turkey or compared to the considerable sums spent by Abu Dhabi. Um, and yet they're making great gains and they exist and they thrive on chaos. Um, so I think that they will try to stir the pot after the elections. Um, and given the financial problems in the East that, that Tim pointed out, I think one of the main threats that will be levied after the elections uh, is this threat that the East will break away and it will put an oil embargo in place. And I think that is one of the few things that could actually spark a conflict. I mean, in this current global environment, where everything's a lot more tense, the Turks are a lot more tired. I don't think anybody really wants a war. Um, but if the oil shuts down again, then I can see um, scenarios pop up whereby different actors make a play for it. You could also see Abu Dhabi trying to provoke militias that 
they have a good relationship with to, to start fighting of their own. Um, so perhaps like in 2014, you see fighting breaking out in different places across the country, but you don't see a big civil war between two larger coalitions. Uh, I hope I did answer the international point that time. Thanks. And thanks again for this great panel, Chris. Thank you, Tarek. That's terrific. Um, pleasure to have you. So we move to Asma. Asma. Final remarks. Final remarks, please. Thank you, Asma. Yeah. Uh, well, I would say that it's it's a tough position uh, um, that we are in because if elections don't happen, it's it's um, a big pro problem not just for the for those involved and in wanting to take power, but also the population in itself that wants to leave this stagnation of being in transitional. Uh, with transitional and sub transitional governments and and their subsequent governments, so there is um, there's also a danger of, and that's not usually emphasized a lot, the danger of completely losing trust in in uh, in the UN or any international um, actor mediating this conflict or facilitating some sort of solution. And if we ourselves as Libyans fail to bring out that solution, what does that mean? in terms of having now, you know, again, two governments in the East and the West. So it's, and if we do have the elections and they are contested, um, then then we're back again to, to civil war um, because Haftar will not accept, be accepted in, in, the, in the West. And I'm thinking Bashara would probably not be accepted in the East. So it's, it's a really, really tricky situation that could have been avoided with some proper preparation. And we, and again, like, and I, I find it really strange. I find I go back thinking on 2011. We also thought back then that we're not completely prepared to run for elections, but we're pressured to run for elections to show that we are a success story of an international intervention. Uh, and now we are trying to show that we are a success story of international mediation. And both are a complete failure. So. I'll stop with that. <laughs> Thank you very much. I find it hard to believe that uh, there will be people who are going to propose that Libya has been a successful intervention, but um, I'm sure some will try. Uh, and, uh, last but certainly not least, um, Tim, uh, final comments from you. Uh, once again, a huge thank you. Thanks very much, Chris, and thanks to Asma and Tarek for the wonderful discussion. Um, I think I would just reiterate a point that I made. So I would, I think we need to get past process for process's sake. Um, I understand the expediency of setting up a date to catalyze action, but I think that the international community has to underscore parameters that are of the lowest, at least get to the lowest bar, lowest threshold of acceptability. And therefore, there needs to be a degree of consensus, a much greater degree of consensus over the legal basis for elections. The candidates need to accept that they will uphold the results. And um, there needs to there, and, and if that requires there to be a delay in process, then I would argue that that would be better than rushing full steam ahead. Because while it is, of course, possible, you know, a kind of uh, a full outbreak of conflict and, and very, very um, difficult circumstances that would follow, there's also a risk that actually once you've done this, how do you put those elections back in the box? And we've seen we're still dealing with the results of um, elections in 2014, contested agreements. So the new any new start has to come from a base of consensus. Otherwise, I think we've learned um, that it, it is not set to have much of a chance to succeed. Thank you very much uh, to Tim. And also thank you very much to Tarek and Asma. I think that was a really rich discussion. Um, I think you summed it up very well there, Tim, you know, process for process's sake. It's hard to see how the 24th of December elections uh, based on what you've said and what we've all been reading, will resolve the sorts of issues that we'd hoped they would. Um, uh, I think Tarek is right. I think the, the issue is really about, you know, the 25th, 26th of December and not the, the exact date. So um, we will be, you know, for those who didn't catch all of it, th this uh, recording will be up on the website. And just to remind you that if uh, if you haven't already, please do join Carbu as, as members. Uh, the details are on our website. 
we'd love, love to have you joining and uh, we will be doing obviously more meetings on this and, and, and especially on Libya, a, a very important subject. And I'm very pleased that uh, Kabu is now acting as the Secretariat for the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Libya so that we can try and stimulate some of these debates in the political circles in Britain and hope perhaps that Britain will be uh, uh, a uh, positive, constructive and effective actor, um, you know, going forward, um, hopefully with other partners in the international community. But thank you all once again for attending. Um, a real pleasure to have you all on for your participation, questions and above all to our speakers.